<laughs> Good evening, everybody. It's nice to see you all again. My name is Sharon Chaden Glass, and we are here in the IDEA networking session for April 2023. I have two new guest speakers to share with you today. We first have Kevin Corcoran. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and our second speaker is Ivory Smith, who is on the way in, and I'm going to make sure that she has her time zones correct. Um, hopefully, she's just um, delayed a bit, but we will see her soon. I wanted to start our session today. Oh, I don't think I introduced myself again. I, I do that sometimes. My name is Sharon Chaden Glass. I'm an instructional designer for Sinclair Community College. I just stepped into that role in January. And before that, I was an instructional media designer in a different part of our e-learning division. So now I'm actually creating the courses. There's Ivory. I'm actually creating the courses, um, particularly with science, engineering, and mathematics for our community college. And also, Ivory was just just made it in, so um, we'll get to meet her in a couple minutes. As our guest speakers are talking, please go ahead and write down your questions to ask them in breakout rooms after they each have a few minutes to talk and share how they got into instructional design. We'll be going into breakout rooms, and you can ask them more specific questions. And I, as always, will stay out in the main room if you want to chat with me. Kevin. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, I'm going to hand it off to you. So like, my name is Kevin Corcoran, and uh, my journey started with the pandemic. I taught for over 20 years in public education in STEM. And then um, one thing led to another. I, I retired, but I couldn't stay retired. And then I got into ID. I was doing it remotely. Uh, some of it was freelancing, and uh, it could be it. It was a tough journey. It could be a little rough, and then here I got to work with with people, and that's really what I like. But at the same time, I'm still remote half the half the week, so it's a nice combination. So transitioning to ID. Uh, I think what a lot of people, I, I look at it like an analogy, you're a swimmer. As a teacher, you're a swimmer. And instructors are swimmers, but it's where you swim. Uh, with teaching, you kind of have that lane, you have that classroom, you're in the pool lanes in, as a classroom educator. When you get into ID, you're still using all those skills, but it's more in the in adult education, Sharon, as you know, it, it it's wide open. So you have corporate and higher education setting. It's it's a little bit different. You're still a swimmer though. So, but you need equipment. So everybody wants to hire somebody with equipment if they're going to go out in the ocean. So with that. Some of the basics are books, website, organizations, really like basic stuff that a lot of you already know, like Microsoft and Excel and all those things are still tools that are very important. They're the basics for even ID. And then you get into videos, which a lot of you use with Camtasia. So those are the two big ones. And then, of course, if you're going to surf or you're going to swim out there, you need the software and Articulate and Captivate and Lectora are the popular ID softwares. Now, if you get into the, the wave running and all that stuff, that's kind of your augmented reality and AR. It's there, but it's not as big as people think. And the VR is kind of like your wave runner. But it's really that snorkel and that boogie board and that board that really drive it, those kind of skills. So you're probably sitting out there in the middle of that water wondering, where am I going to go? Well, just keep swimming. That's all I got to say. You'll find your way. It's a lot like dating. I know some of you, you're going to get rejected. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to get depressed. You're going to get stressed. 
and you're going to get ghost. That's just what happens. It happens to everybody. So don't take it personal, especially when you're struggling. But you will find someone. Sometimes it's just luck. I got lucky with this one. I put out for a lot of them, and then all of a sudden it came up out of nowhere, and it was just like, bam. So be kind to yourself. These are some things that are in the chat. These organizations are really helpful. They have to do with training and development. This one is um, the Association for Talent Development. You'll meet a lot of people here. It's a really open community as well as um, the. Oh, this is the Greater Philadelphia one of mine, so if you're in that area. Another thing, um, hold on there. Just ask for help, really. The, it, it is a great community, ID people. They're all there to help you. Everybody's been through a lot of what you're going through right now. These two sites here, though, uh, Sharon's going to put them in the, the chat. These are the best for starting or anybody because they've organized and curated a lot of sites. So like Mo's notes is a, is actually a Google docs thing, but it has so many resources in it that whatever you're looking to do, whatever links you need about anything, I, I've tried to find something that they, they're missing and I can't find it. So they have everything to everyone here on this site. So instead of you trying to guess where to go, you, it's here. It's all here. I refer to it quite a bit. And, um, whoops. And Catherine Richard, he's a great person. You can always reach out to him too. He has a great transition with all kinds of free for people transitioning. Really excellent website everything you could think of and sites and people to talk to. So I kind of rushed through it there, but that's really it. And then there's mine, uh, my LinkedIn. You can always reach out to me at, at LinkedIn as well. And I'll, I'll stop sharing here. Are there any questions? I kind of ran through that. I'll say um, when you were talking about higher education being like uh, in adult education being more like an ocean wave, I that made me when I looked at your slides originally a couple days ago, um, I definitely felt like that was true because in higher ed and adult education, enrollment can fluctuate so much. And I used to teach international students English, and um, we would feel those fluctuations a whole lot more than the rest of the college or university that I was teaching at. Um, just stuff changes so much from year to year. K-12, I mean, <laughs> not saying that there's you're, you're immune to those kinds of changes when you're in K-12, but they're a lot, they tend to be a lot less sudden. There's more of a steady stream of every year you show up and there's gonna be a certain number of students. And um, what the changes that I have been seeing lately in K-12 in the last year or so have been not enough teachers because guess what? They're trying to get out of the classroom. People are losing their minds. <laughs> so, um, Ivory, are you here? I see you. I see your... Um... Um, yeah, the other thing too is like people, if you're, don't press yourself. Like if you're in teaching and you want to get into this, learn articulate, even PowerPoint, you know, they have so many, just start with PowerPoint. It's a powerful tool, PowerPoint. You can make videos. You can do all kinds of things with PowerPoint. It even translates languages. I wish I, I had known all of that because like when you're dealing with English as a second language students, which a lot of people are, and they're having to deal with instruction like that, using a PowerPoint that can translate for you. And yeah. it, it does, that doesn't really cost you anything much with PowerPoint. Yeah, it's super cool that it can do that now, do those live translations in the captions. Um, Ivory, I'm going to yeah. give you the spotlight here. All righty. 
Um, first of all, I would like to apologize to everyone for my tard tardiness and my location. I am in Eastern Standard Time, and for some reason, I had this saved at seven o'clock. I mean, I'm I'm in Central Standard Time. So, um, excuse me, I I deeply apologize for that. Um, but to give my background, um, I was in education. Um. I like to joke about teaching all the grades um, because, honestly, the only profession that I've ever worked in was education. Um, my first job as an eighth grader was at a counselor at my elementary school. Um, and so from there, I went to Michigan State University, and I have just been – I've been a was officially a an educator for five years. Um, a lot like Sharon, I started overseas where I taught English as a foreign language in Colombia, uh, South America. And um, you all can see me, correct? I'm just making sure. Yep, I see you just fine. Okay, okay, perfectly. Uh, um, so I was teaching for a year English as a foreign language from sixth graders to 11th grade um, in Columbia, that high school stops at 11th grade. Um, so those were our seniors. Um, and from there, um, I got into grad school where I was going to be getting my master's in curriculum and instruction, but that wasn't going to start until half the year. So I decided, okay, well, I come home to Chicago for six months just to move to Texas again. So why don't I just stay here in Columbia, further my expertise, and um, just go to Texas from Columbia. So for six months, I got a taste of corporate education. Um, obviously, that's going to be important. <laughs> leading up until now. Um, so for six months, I taught business English to um, adults and corporate. Um, and these were in companies like Adidas, Samsung, you know, um, companies that had large international, um, you know, reach. And so when they would go to those conferences or, you know, meetings that English was that lingua franca. So they were, you know, brushing up on their English skills to work in those corporate settings. Um, so after that, I came back to Texas where I was working at a bilingual um, school. It was the only bilingual school in the district, which is if you all were like me, you're like, how is that a thing? And this is Texas. Um, and so from there, in the next four years, I was in different classrooms, second, fifth, fourth, and fifth split. Um, and also, that was during the time of COVID. Um, so there were just a lot of transitions. And at that point, I just felt like, you know, I'm great at this. I'm great at teaching. I'm great at designing instruction. I'm great at um, leading learners to growth, but I just was not fulfilled in, you know, the world of education <laughs> in that sense. Um, so I was like, but I really liked corporate. Like when I did it there, I liked it. Is it would it be the same at home? And so last year was my last academic year in the classroom. Um, and during that time, I would just set myself up to transition from the classroom and looking into different corporate positions. I wasn't sure what I wanted, really. I'm like, okay, whoever, whatever I can do that's like teaching, like, right, like whatever that is. I wasn't totally sure about all the different titles and the aspects of those titles, um, but I was kind of learning as I was going and quite frankly applying as, how, as I was going I would not recommend that to you all and I have a lot of tips on things to do um that so you do not have to have the kind of experience that I had um but eventually I found out okay like instructional design that is an umbrella as opposed to just a specific title and so with that I started learning things about instructional design that I did like and things that I would want to get into and I think I was 
officially unemployed um, for four months. I don't count the summertime um, because, you know, it's still I still had my funds and savings, you know, um, from saving throughout the year and things like that. So I was officially unemployed from where I sent, submitted my um, letter of res resignation in August. And so and by December, I um, was able to get the position that I have now. I am an instructional designer. And the way my supervisor likes to describe it, she says, Ivory, you are 90 percent an instructional designer and 10 percent a trainer, which was what I wanted. I did not want to be someone who was 100 percent a curriculum builder without ever getting to deliver that Um curriculum. I love being in front of people. I love being there for the aha moments. I love, you know, those connections and those relationships that you make. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm happy with where I am. I'm technically a hybrid. I, I work I mean, my position is hybrid where I do most of my writing and designing at home. Um, but I do go in a few days out of the month to deliver those trainings um, in person. Um, and so that's kind of like a, a sped up version of where I was, my background, and where I am now. Is there anything I'm leaving out, something that I should throw in right now, Sharon, or yeah. are we waiting for the breakouts? I think that that's perfect um, for okay. getting started. And I know that people will have questions in the breakout rooms. I, when Okay. When we were getting situated here, I was like, mm -hmm. I a couple times I've had people um, in central time show up like right before we end. And I'm like, oh, I don't want that to happen just in case that's the thing. Because my sister's yeah. also in Chicago and we, we do this all the time. We forget we're an hour apart. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, my sister's in LA and we do the same thing all the time. I'm like, wait a minute, what time is it there? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so, the yeah. world. It's round and stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm just looking in the chat here. Um, mm. What's the difference between teaching corporate training and ID? Let's do that one in the breakout rooms. Okay. Um, I, I would def. Do you want to take that one in the breakout rooms, Ivory? I could take it now if ever because sure, it seems like we had a couple of people ask it. I just want to make so sure. so instructional design, like I said, it is an umbrella. So like um imagine if I don't know, I'm trying to think of a position that we're maybe we use. It's just a, it can be a generic position title, right? Like a lot of people just slap instructional design in their role, but that can mean many things, and that often means different things to different companies and different corporations, right? So instructional design for some people mean like you just design the curriculum, you write it, you send it out, somebody else builds it, somebody else you know does the graphics for it, somebody else delivers it. You're just the writer. For some instructional design positions, you are the writer, the graphic designer. Like that's when that articulate and storyline comes into play, those tools. You do that and you deliver it, right? Um, and some places I've even seen where an instructional designer just designs it and delivers it right? Does those trainings. So really what I would say is when you're looking into like instructional design positions, really make sure to read the job description because what you may be looking to do may be different than what is actually um what, what that company wants you to do. Does that answer the question? Oh, and so e-learning. So e-learning is like uh, online learning. Um, so those are the trainings that are not live instructor led that are typically um, learner led like they it's self paced right so that's when we're looking at those videos that are pre recorded or a lot of things that they're doing now in e learnings they're gamifying the e learning so making the learning like a game you're playing a game and either you're following a character or you are the character so the e learnings are just a, a type of it's a um a mode of uh, a delivery method of the education, the training that we're doing. 
because keep in mind as an instructional designer, you could also be designing um, material to be delivered in person. Absolutely. And um, when you were talking about, uh, shoot, I lost my train of thought. I feel like this happens as I get older. Mm. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> I put in the chat um, just to piggyback on what Ivory was saying about the differences in these terms. I have a, pres a presentation I made a year ago where I, I kind of go into greater detail about where these different fields came from, why they're called learning design and instructional design. Um, you can dive into that for a little bit. Um, let's go ahead and go to the breakout rooms. Okay, we are back. And I wanted to mention before we get going into the whole group Q&A that our next session is May 2nd from 7 to 8 p.m. It's also a Tuesday, um, Eastern Standard Time. And I also, I have one announcement because this comes out this month. So this book um, it, by Megan Kohler and Crick, Chris Gamrat. Um, can you see this okay? Just nod if you can. Yep. Um, this comes out this month and uh, I am one of the contributors, Erica Fleming, and I co-wrote a chapter together um, for this multidisciplinary instructional designer book. And it is all about how people use their previous background experiences to um, enrich their experience as an instructional designer. So there's chapters in here on the transition from teaching dance, you know, and like a whole bunch of other stuff. So um, I encourage you to take a look at that. I'll put the uh, link in the chat for you to review at your leisure. We'll start with Kim's question. Kim's question was she is looking for tips on transitioning into the field of instructional design after having experience in training, um, curriculum development, and developing um, professional development. Um, Ivory, I think you talked a little bit about this. Do you want to pick this one up? For sure, I can. Um, and I, I I'm going to, if y'all don't mind, I'm going to keep my camera off just because okay. I felt distracting to myself. Sure. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so one thing that I kind of ended on in my session is something that I just learned on my journey in transitioning. And that was that I found that at first I was trying to transform, right? Like, how do I, in these interviews, how do I transform myself to show that I'm already an instructional designer, right? Like, yeah, like you'll want me, right? And I was doing that so much and it didn't feel authentic to me. And I'm sure it didn't feel authentic to the people I was, you know, interviewing for. Mm -hmm. And so what I said is that I learned to stop trying to transform and to try to translate, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of us here are, educators in the traditional sense like k-12 education um and most people do not know what we do like they do not have an idea of what a typical day in the life of a k-12 or i would even argue like higher education educators do right they don't know that the project managing that goes into working across like um subjects matter and subject or content right working across content leaders and how are we going to educate these kids and for how long a day um based on science they don't know what it takes to um get a field trip right like all the people who we have to go through to do those things and they don't know how that's transferable to what we would do in these different organizations right um and it's not their job to quite frankly their job is to know their job their job isn't to know ours and in those interviews is our job to say hey i've done the in the research on what it is that you all want and what it is typically that an, in this case an instructional designer does 
I am not classically trained or officially trained as an instructional designer. I am an educator, but let me tell you how all the things that I've done as an educator translate into what you need as an instructional designer. How, uh, and, and what I said is I developed a, a Google portfolio like a Google Doc portfolio. No, I don't know what storyline is, or I know what storyline is. I'm sorry. Definitely go in there knowing what the tools are, right? Um, and I'm not a pro at storyline. I'm very novice. But in my in, in my research on what storyline is, I've seen that it is similar to what I use, which is called Nearpod. Here are some of my Nearpod lessons. Here are some how I built these lessons, right? There I've taken lessons from blank slates and turn them into this so like really take that time to translate what it is that we've done and to show how you've done your research on what the role that you want is I think that was a little long-winded but I hope I gave enough <laughs> of yeah. an example and I just put in the chat to um a link to keywords for instructional design designer job searches also somewhere in my google drive i have a document or maybe it was shared with me it was actually if you have teacher vocabulary in your resume then use this for corporate does anyone know what i'm talking about i have a document like that i'll look for it um are there other questions people have Also to that point, Sharon, I I'm, I don't know if there is like the document, but I know I've seen a few of them floating around. And so I think if you can just like Google like teacher lingo to ID or different things like that, like I think there are a few visual like visuals floating around that kind of assists with that. Here was it. <laughs> have so many things called instructional design in my Google Drive. Here's a, a link for uh, if you want to just freelance. You'd be surprised like what what you could do. So this is a pretty good link. I think would help people. They really help guide you. So someone like who, who Kim I think you'd be surprised. You could probably jump in right away. Say, hey, I could do that. You never know what they're looking for. Yeah. Let me, sorry. Th this helps get you started. And then there are different sites that you can go to. There's companies that will hire freelancers. Mm -hmm. uh, if you make something like uh, Irie said, just something on Google and show some of your stuff, you'd be surprised. You do have to have a portfolio or something to show up. But it doesn't always have to be something big. It could be like different things with PowerPoints or if you're into curriculum writing, you show them that. Yeah. Something that came up in um, the main room out here, we were talking about um, the question about, um, you know, should I have, what should I have done differently in the interview? And I brought up, you know, you, you're not, you almost never know which candidates you're going up against. So it could have come down to a situation where even though you had some experience in what they were looking for, maybe someone else had more experience and there's, you know, there's nothing you can really do about that. Um, but by the same token, you could put your resume in for a job that you feel like you don't have a chance at. And maybe you're the best qualified person <laughs> of that pool of candidates. Um, you, you just don't know unless, unless you try. Um, but I would also put out there, don't apply for a job that you, you really don't intend to take. Cause I mean, <laughs> what if you are like the top qualified candidate? Are you really, you going to turn it down or, or are you going to take a job that you're like, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I guess you can do what you want to do, but if it if it were me and and I applied for something like particularly, uh, what was one of the jobs I saw? It was like training manuals for like aircraft machinery or something. I'm like, that sounds cool for the right person. I think it's me. 
Um, but if I had a different frame of mind, really willing to get into that, sure. Maybe you would too. I don't know. We have a couple minutes left. Um, any last questions? Ivory? I do have something oh. as far as a tip. Okay. And this is actually like, I would definitely say leverage LinkedIn. Don't just leverage the content, but also leverage the content creators like you. So when you are making connections, like if you don't have premium, you have when you send a message to somebody or when you want to connect with them, there's an option to like send them a message, right? Use that as your intro. Introduce yourself. Hey, this is why I would like to connect with you. I'm a transitioning teacher and I'm really interested in following your journey, right? Something like that, right? Leverage LinkedIn because there are so many people who are willing to assist you for free, right? For free. There's always going to be somebody trying to sell you something, but there are people who are willing to give you quality information for free. Some of the stuff to buy is definitely quality as well. But if you're like me, where you're out of work and still looking for, you know, that transition, like the for free hits hard, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the best tips that I got from an, um, a person on LinkedIn who I follow. Um, I will have to share his name later um, because I can't remember his last name, but I know his first name is Jermaine. One thing that he said is that he kept a work diary. Hmm. And in that work diary, he every day he wrote what he did, what he learned, what tasks he completed. Hmm. And I, he said that was helpful for him for two reasons one when he was updating his resume mm -hmm. well three reasons one when he was updating his resume he was able to go back and be like oh yeah I did all of these things also he said when it came time for annual appraisals he was like yeah this is all the things that I did this year right and so that will really come in helpful if you're trying to nego negotiate your salary or negotiate a promotion or negotiate all of these things that we typically don't have to do as teachers because it's kind of built into our track right mm -hmm. lastly the reason that he said it, it is beneficial because if you end up leaving <laughs> <laughs> you can talk about all the things that you said you've done um to another potential employer mm -hmm. so that is what I have been doing and I didn't wait till I got hired I started keeping a diary in my interview process so mm -hmm. this is my diary oh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you all can see it right now but this is my work diary and it says written on it interview notes and I have that sectioned off from the my the things that they said to me in the interviews, but also my reflections afterwards, hmm. what could have went better, and any feedback that because I always ask for feedback if, when you got those unfortunately emails. Okay, so I'm that that's not great news, not what I was looking for. But what what were some of my strong suits, and where would you say I could you know be stronger? Put it in a notebook, and then from day one. Um, I just completed my 60th day at my new, um, in my position as an instructional designer. From day one, I wrote everything I have completed each nice. day. So I have a 60-day ledger of so far what I have done in my role as an instructional designer. So that's going to help me with those three things Jermaine said. But also, I'm using it as my tool to help other teachers who are looking to transition into instructional design. Like, and I can go back and this is my resource for myself. Um, so keep that diary. You don't have to wait until you get the job. Use it now. That is so awesome. <laughs> Very just inspirational. <laughs> and right. literally when I'm looking back, I'm like, wow. This is four months worth of information. Yeah. And I literally had a friend who was like, you could sell this as an ebook," And I'm like, there I'm not go. selling this to anybody because this is all game that I got for free. That would not be right. I just put it in a, oh. I put it in a book. And so when I go and I'm, I'm chatting with folks, like I take it with me. 
because that's my resource too. Yeah. All right, everybody, we have reached the end and I want to say thank you so much, Ivory and Kevin, for coming and sharing your experiences today. We um, are always so appreciative uh, when people share their time and I can't wait to see where you land, Ivory. Okay. And um, I know that this is just the beginning of the journey life takes you places that you never expected to go i hope i see you all back here in may have a wonderful evening everyone see you then thank you thank you so much <laughs>